Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the A Word to the Wise podcast, a space where we curate conversations around mind, body, spirit, and personal development. I'm your host, Jumi Moses. Before we get into today's show, I want to take this moment to let you know that this episode is not suitable for minors because we'll be touching on sensitive topics. So if you're listening to this episode on speaker, if you're in a car driving and a minor is present, please make sure that you take this episode off speaker or listen to it at a different time when the minor is not present. Okay, so on the show today is Patrick Eilers. Patrick is a master's level clinician, receiving his degree from Moody Theological Seminary, Michigan. He works at the intersection of psychology, therapy, and theology. He's also a licensed professional counselor in the state of Michigan and has been working in the field of psychology since 2016 and as a specialist in the field of sexual addiction since 2020. He is a member of the American Counseling Association. Patrick also has a professional life coach certification. He is also a Green Cross member of Traumatology. He is part of the Michigan Counselors Association and the American Association of Christian Counselors. So today's conversation is part one of a two-part series where we dive into porn and sex addiction. This addiction is a pretty common addiction, but yet nobody really talks about it, mainly because there's a lot of shame around this addiction and a lot of people are not forthcoming about it because a lot of people might shun them or think that they're weird. According to psychology, today, age 13 on average is when most people watch porn for the first time. For most boys and an increasing number of girls, it's the beginning of a lifelong habit. Around 80% of men and 30% of women consume porn weekly. So again, this is a very common addiction that most people deal with, but nobody's really talking about it. And nobody's really talking about the resources out there for people who are struggling with it. That's why I thought it was very important to have a specialist come on the show who specializes in porn and sex addiction to talk more about the addiction, how it affects people, how it affects relationships, and to also offer guidance and resources on how to overcome this addiction if you find yourself struggling with it. So in my conversation with Patrick, we discuss what causes porn addiction, how to tell if you're a sex addict and or a porn addict, how social media affects or promotes porn addiction, how therapy can help with recovery, how emotions and mental health correlate to compulsive sexual behaviors, how porn addiction affects romantic relationships, and how faith and religion play a role in recovery and much more. This was a very insightful conversation with Patrick. I hope that you learned from this conversation. And if you are struggling with this addiction, I hope that this conversation offers you guidance and you can find some resources to help you move through this addiction. Here's my conversation with Patrick. Patrick, welcome to A Word to the Wise. It's really nice to have you on the show. You're a licensed professional counselor, and a lot of your work is at the intersection of psychology, therapy, and theology. And I was very fascinated by the theology aspect because I haven't come across a lot of mental health professionals who add that as an element to their work um, or therapeutic approach. And I'm curious to know why adding theology as part of your approach towards mental health services is important to you. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank you, Jimmy, for having me today. Um, that's a great, great question. And it's something that is absolutely part of my, uh, a little bit mostly of educational background. So I, I went to, uh, I graduated from Moody Theological Seminary in Michigan, uh, which is associated with Moody Theological in, in Chicago. And um, so the background of our, uh, you know, our program is really about trying to bring, uh, yes, there's a mental health component to to things, but also bring the spiritual component into that and kind of merging those. And I found with me that it's a little bit more of my perspective. So my perspective on how to help people are sort of kind of how how we get to certain or arrive to certain things in mental health. 
But I think the other side of that too is that also as an extension to what I do um, for clients coming in who are interested in exploring that aspect of more about their life or about you know, in, in their relationship with God and those kind of things. So I think that's really where you can add that as an extension uh, as far as helping people, you know, make sense of not only their sort of physical place and kind of some things we know from science, but also, you know, then going back to the theological component is that ultimately it all comes back to, you know, where do our, where we put our faith and where does our faith stand with, uh, within the, our life and, and those kind of things. So um, it is, a, it is a nice to have that perspective, but again, it's kind of something really it's client to client because I, I usually try to let that be in the client's hands as far as what, how far they would like to go with that. So um, but certainly part of my uh, background of um, uh, education. That makes sense that you'd kind of put it in the client's hand and see if they're comfortable with that aspect of your work. So why specialize in sex and porn addiction recovery? Something that a lot of people are struggling with, but it's not a space where I see a lot of mental health professionals kind of specialize in. So what led you to specializing in, in that form of addiction recovery. Absolutely. Yeah. The, the, the biggest thing, you know, kind of going back to, you got to re- re- go back in time a little bit here to 2020. And uh, during the pandemic, uh, I was, I was working at a startup clinic. And so I was kind of more of a general practitioner. I've been a general practitioner most of my career um, until I came here to North Point. And uh, when I had an opportunity to come here, um, the way I saw it, saw it was that, uh, you know, there was a lot of different, there's a big need for this particular type of uh, help for folks, right? This is, you know, beyond just the church, there's a lot of uh, part of this in the culture that's absolutely been, um, a lot of people are suffering with it and they don't they even know, they don't know it or, or they also maybe even not even sure how to necessarily get help in that way. So there's very, there's also very few therapists, like you mentioned, who are specializing in. So I felt, well, this is an opportunity. I see a need. Um, let me see if I can meet that need and see kind of how that's gone. So uh, that was almost four years ago. So now I have an opportunity since then that I've really been learning a lot about you know, how to help people, um, not only with the addiction piece, but then also in their own life, kind of what is healthy, what's unhealthy sexuality and that, and that kind of idea. And I know for, even from my own experience, like what it really did that look like throughout my life growing up. And, and there was a period in my life where certainly adolescence and early, early you know, young adulthood, um, I struggled with porn too. So I was in that same kind of boat. I kind of know what people have gone through with that aspect. So I did have some relational connection in that way, my own story, but then also just you know, knowing, seeing this as a need and knowing, you know, Hey, like when there's a need, if I can meet that need, um, let me use the skills that God gave me to be able to do that. So that's kind of where I was wanting to step into that space as far as, uh, you know, being able to specialize in it. Do you have a number in terms of the amount of men that suffer from sex and porn addiction and, or not number, but I, I should say statistic on the number of men that suffer with porn addiction versus women? Because when I hear of sex or porn addiction, it's usually men that comes to mind with who struggle with that type of addiction. But I presume women are also affected by this. Absolutely. And there, and there's, there's more, it's growing that there's more women that are starting to suffer with it. Absolutely. Uh, And there probably has always been to some degree, it's just Usually in the past, it was more what they called love addiction or more relational addiction rather than necessarily the porn piece or maybe even like, you know, multiple, you know, relationships, that kind of thing. Um, majority of the people I work with are men for number one, because I'm a man. So a lot of men feel comfortable talking with men. So our man. So that's a, the majority of why I have mostly men. And, and then I know but other colleagues here that work, uh, they do have in the practice, uh, they are, there are a lot of, of some of our female colleagues and they, they work with other women. So we do have women that do come in. It's not as predominantly, um, like you said, it's mostly known for being kind of a, a man's, uh, particular, you know, concern, but there are also women who are, who are struggling with it too. Um, statistic wise, I mean, I've, I've kind of looked at some different things. I, I don't have any personal, like immediate statistics. I can tell you that like I said majority, if not all my clients are, that I work with are men, but, um, I found in the Mayo Clinic about in 2019, their their research was about 68% of the population in the United States. About 24 million people are considered to be sex addicts. Now, whether or not that actually means that they're diagnosably addictive, that's one that's that's here and there, because ultimately it's probably more than 24 million people are struggling with some type of uh, compulsive sexual behavior. So again, going back to either whether it be masturbation, um, pornography use, whatever the case might be. So there, um, we also don't know a lot of this also from the perspective of there's a lot of people who don't report. So we also, there's a perspective of people that the 68% seems a little low to me just because there's the amount of people that don't report. So that's probably much higher than that. 
Um, but their, their sort of statistics were based on anybody who was watching pornography 11 plus hours a week. Um, and it can vary, you know, it depends on the people's stories, but certainly that aspect of usually you being a, a weekly or daily use user of pornography or unhealthy sexual behavior of any kind is, is pretty common. So from that perspective, to have that number be six to eight percent seems a little bit low. And it's also 2019. So um, the stats are not super recent, but um, the most recent I could find. That makes a lot of sense where you said a lot of people are not reporting their addiction to pornography or sex because there's a lot of shame that goes or there's a lot of shame that comes with admitting that maybe a lot of people are not even aware that it's an addiction and I want to talk about that a little bit later but I want to know does sex addiction and porn addiction do they go hand in hand I'm sure some people have porn and sex addiction but are they categorized differently are they the same thing or are they, do they have two different characteristics? Uh, I wouldn't say they have different characteristics. I, I think uh, the one way I would look at it is that I always think a compulsive sexual behavior is, am I using sex in a way that is to either cope with something that's going on with my life, deal with un, un, unhealthy or maybe um, uh, uncomfortable emotions in my life? Uh, using sex in a way that's self-serving would be another way of kind of put that in that sense. So the, basically I'm, I'm using sex as kind of the vessel similarly to you might see with alcohol or drugs or something like that, where you're, you're still getting away from um, that particular, um, your particular emotions you're trying to avoid. So there's, there, there's that aspect of that. That's certainly at, at play. The one difference between kind of porn and, and sex addiction a little bit is that porn porn can escalate people's behavior. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to, but sometimes it does. So sometimes what you'll see is people will start watching porn and eventually that'll turn in and translate into other unhealthy sexual behavior. Sometimes it's the other way around. Sometimes you have the set the the sex addiction is also another way people act out with porn. So it, I wouldn't say they correlate, but maybe a, maybe a sort of a spectrum if you think about it in that way. So on one side, you kind of have fantasy sex and then all the way down to what they call exploitative sex. So you kind of have a large range of behaviors. And uh, and so certainly porn fit falls into that category, if that, uh, if that, if that makes sense. Yes, what you said makes a lot of sense. And as you were talking, I couldn't help but think about what triggers potential sex or porn addiction within people. And I know that you mostly work with men. So what are some of the reasons that you're seeing them develop these addictions? Is it related to self-esteem? Is it some sort of trauma that they had to endure? What are some common threads that you've noticed as to what could be trigger points for people who develop these sex and porn addictions? Yeah, absolutely. So there are probably about 10 things, 10, you want to call them symptoms, we would typically look for. What I will say is I'll only touch on a few of those because there's, they're very, they're, some are kind of common for folks and some of them are not so common for folks depending on their story. I think when no matter if it's men or women, it, there's the first part of it is, you know, how early was your exposure to sex? Meaning how early did you start to experience either porn or, or viewing uh, some type of material, uh, eroticism, erotic, like erotic stories, those kind of things. A lot of folks uh, nowadays, especially with the way the Internet is and the way we have a lot of these connections with, with the Internet, is that this can be starting for some folks at as early as five and six years old when you have an exposure. It doesn't mean that you're going to be clinically diagnosable as being an addict at five years old but it means that you're going to be starting to have that exposure at that age, that that's something that's common for people. So we do see a lot of this, this early exposure for folks. That's something, again, it could be that you ran across pornography accidentally. It could be that you intentionally looked at it, but it, the reality is you have some type of early exposure that tends to make a, a like a, a thumb. If you think a thumbprint in a paper, right? That's when you put ink on your, on your thumb and you hit and you push pressed against that paper. That's a pretty big imprint. And the earlier ages, the earlier our ages have that imprint, that's going to stick with us. So that's a really, that's a pretty big impact, that first impact we've had. Another thing that we look for is, again, you mentioned abuse uh, scenarios. And sometimes that is part of people's story. Unfortunately, people have some, had some type of an abuse in their story. It doesn't necessarily mean that, that again, that that's for everybody or everybody's story, but certainly part of some people's experiences. Uh, another thing we might look for is that they come from a background that it's very rigid, very uh, the structure of the family is very rigid. And so sex is something that's not talked about. So it, it's almost on one side of the extreme is that you're, you're kept, it's kept under wraps so much that there's a, there's a curiosity to that. There's a wanting to know more about it. And so that kind of leads them into this behavior. 
On the air side, according to people who were overexposed. So you have people on the air side where very early on, porn's accepted, porn's normalized. Uh, just like the person who maybe struggling with alcohol is the same kind of thing. If, if the home life is their alcohol is normalized, they're going to probably be pretty comfortable around alcohol, just like they would be around porn if that's part of their experience. So those are a few of the things you might look for. The other one that I would also say is that they've had some type of, um, uh, so in that early exposure a- aspect, there are, um, you know, what has been some other relational things that are going on, uh, especially when you talk about, um, you know, unhealthy sexual behavior, you know, as far as masturbation goes, I mean, it's, it's, it's sex with yourself. So, you know, how sex is defined very early for folks is a big part of also kind of that development of how you see it, what it looks like for you, how you know what that is, those kind of things. So that's a, that's another part of it, I would say, is a, it's kind of in that, in that same range of things that we typically look for. Do you also believe that a lot of people who struggle with this type of addiction, do you think it's also related to self-esteem issues? Because I know we talked a lot about early exposure and potentially growing up in a very rigid household. I know some people who grow up in a very rigid household, related, especially a very rigid religious household, and they're basically told that any sort of sexual thought or impulse is really wrong. So they have to kind of hold that within themselves. But I mean, they end up finding it they end up using porn as an outlet to express that. But do you also find that people who develop this addiction have issues in terms of relating to other people in terms of romantic interests or potentially have self-esteem issues? So it's just easier for them to turn to something on the computer rather than actually interact with a regular person. Absolutely. Yeah. So belief system is huge. So belief system of, in regards to what do I think about myself? How do I think about, you know, where do I fall? If you're talking about kind of in a religious aspect or theological aspect, you know, where do I fall within? How does God see me? You know, what are some of those kind of things? I think absolutely from the perspective of, you know, if my, if I don't think I'm worthy, that's the one that comes up quite a bit, right? I'm not worthy. If I don't feel like I'm worthy, I'm probably not going to do the things that are going to be healthy for me because my thought life is going to be affected by that. I tell people all the time that your, your thought life has really got a lot to do with what your behavior is going to be. And so there's two, kind of two parts to working on things. It's one is what am I thinking about? And then how's that translating into what I'm doing? And so ultimately my thought life is a big part of why I might be acting out. If I think a lot very negatively about myself, or really earlier you mentioned the shame, if I have a lot of shame about myself, um, I'm going to be focused on that particular thought. And I'm probably going to um, more likely to do unhealthy things in that way. I think the other thing you mentioned as well is really, really, and I see this as more of you more younger folks, but it's certainly the idea that um, why would I want to risk having a relationship with somebody who could hurt me when I could just go over here and get my needs met, you know, whether or not that's in hookup culture or if that's in pornography, because I don't need to have a relationship with anybody. So I close myself off to that. Uh, intimacy is really about being all like completely known by somebody else. And so the example I give is, uh, the old show Home Improvement, that Tim Allen, his neighbor, had this really high fence. And part of the com- comedy was that you could only see the guy's eyes. So it was like this. And that's a reflection of, to some degree, a person who doesn't want to be intimate, right? They don't really want anyone to know what's going on in their yard. They want to keep completely set, uh, isolated and uh, by themselves. So typically what happens is when people want to be that way, they, they tend to sort of try to find the way they're going to meet their needs because we all have needs in that sense, uh, you know, to be relational beings. That's what we're created to be. So when we're not getting that need met, that ends up uh, creating a lot of isolation, loneliness, like you said, self-esteem concerns, you know, beliefs that I'm not worthy again, kind of going back to that. And so what we see for a lot of folks is that that is a driving force for people, why they might choose to act out. Because again, to risk being with somebody else uh, is a risk. And a lot of people uh, feel that pornography is this safe space for them to be able to express what they're feeling, what they're thinking and and look how let that out. But all that really does is it, it, it alters your mind to thinking, that sex is now about you, right? Sex is completely about yourself rather than being about a relationship. And so um, you're unfulfilled and you continue to be unfulfilled as you, as the further you go down that trail. The nature of the world that we currently live in definitely promotes a lot of, it creates a lot of opportunity for people to turn to pornography or addiction Um rather than actually work hard to make those connections. I saw a recent statistic that said that porn use skyrocketed during COVID 2019. 
or COVID-19 when everybody was at home and under a lot of stress and not really getting a lot of those social interactions. So that makes a lot of sense. And as you were talking, I kind of want to dive deeper into what are some traits? If, if I was listening to this episode and I'm trying to figure out, am I just randomly hooking up with people because I think it's fun versus is this actually a problem? And I have some sort of addiction, whether it's watching too much pornography or hooking up with tons of different people. How can I tell the difference between exploring Mm -hmm. sex or sexuality versus, oh, this is actually a problem? And I get this question a lot and it's, it's somewhat tough to, to kind of put into, into sort of a, you know, here's the things you'd look for as far as, because a lot of times for a lot of people, especially if they really truly are struggling, Um, they're usually in a lot of denial. They're usually very minimizing the behavior. They tend to sort of think it's not affecting anybody. You know, even if it is affecting anybody, it's only affecting me. And like we talked about earlier, if I don't have a lot of self-esteem or a lot of belief that I'm worthy, I'm probably going to, you know, try to avoid, again, it's not going to affect me whether or not I'm I'm doing this for five hours or for, you know, five days. So what I would say is back to kind of the hookup ideas. Yes, there is an aspect where people, you know, certainly want to explore their relationships and understand that. And I think the the part of it where I would go back to is that, yes, am I just getting together for the sex or am I really legitimately trying to find a way to connect with somebody? So going back to that risk idea, how much am I willing to risk in these relationships or am I just sort of putting myself in a position where this girl or this guy is really hot and so I really want to get to get with them sexually, feel good and kind of move on. And so I think there is certainly a cultural trap of that where the idea is that, right, like dating is not like there's no there's not a lot of courtship in dating anymore. People don't try to pursue relationships for connection. They, they pursue, hey, this person's attractive. I feel good around them. And that's pretty much the depth of what that looks like. So part of it is, I think, you know, what 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 really ultimately is your, your goal of dating or your goal of going out and looking for a relationship? Are you looking to find somebody to, to really connect with and be more vulnerable with? Are, are you being more vulnerable in that? Um, a process as you get to know more people. I think the other part of that is I was going you know, to go back to thought life. You know, how much am I thinking about sex? How much am I thinking about that porn that I watched? How much am I objectifying the people around me? I hear all the time people report it on a regular basis that preoccupation, which is those thoughts that we cannot break from, uh, those same fantasies that are rolling in our head. You know, the person we see jogging down the road, or the person we see at the grocery store, or the person that's the coworker, whatever. Those people are just, they keep playing, you know, to use a, a use a phrase the kids use, right? It's a, they, let's live it in my hand, re, head rent free, right? So it's keep, it keeps just playing around in my mind. And so because I'm not able to break from that, um, it, that's where I'm going to probably be much more willing to fantasize about stuff that I'm going to look for online. So that's going to probably drive me more into, into pornography or por, you know, pornographic type material. Again, social media plays a role in that as well, because a lot of stuff that's on social media which is not meant to be sexual is sexualized. I mean, I can, I mean, you go on Instagram, you look up anything about hiking. Most of those hiking things, even though they're not meant to be sexual, have a sexualized material in them to some degree, whether it be the clothes, whether it be the poses, whatever it might be. So one of the things I think we need to consider in that as well is that, okay, so if, if I've said, I don't want to do this behavior anymore, but I continue to compulsively do it, I feel sad. I feel anxious. I feel whatever. And then I'm going to respond by going and acting out and using porn um, or, or finding someone to, to fill that void. That's an ever never ending pit that I cannot fill up. And so no matter how many times I do that, I'm never going to be able to be satisfied. Like we kind of talked about earlier. And so those would be maybe some things if you're talking about kind of signposts of, you know, there's a possibility that this is something that's going down a path that's going to end up being uh, unhealthy for you in the long run. And then ultimately, you know, kind of going back to like the relational piece um, do I see relationships as, you know, self-serving or do I see them as, you know, uh, opportunities for vulnerability and connection? And I think that's where you talk about in that aspect, um, like you said, unhealthy sexual behavior almost always is self-serving. It's interesting that you said that a lot of what we see online now is so sexualized and I could not agree more. I mean, even things that are not supposed to be sexy are super sexy. And, you know, I think having this critique sometimes could come off as if you're trying to be super conservative with your ideas, because we're definitely living in an era of soul liberation, people being able to express themselves. But I do think that it's done a little bit too much. 
And I think as a young person on social media, I, I could not imagine seeing certain images or being exposed to certain things as a teenager or um, an adolescent, right? And I think a lot of young people, a lot of kids, a lot of teenagers, just really exposed to hyper-sexualized content, um, whether it's covertly or explicitly just in your face. So I do think that plays a huge role. And, you know, to your point, in terms of characteristics of people kind of using sex or porn as a way to avoid intimate relationships as kind of like a guidepost of, okay, this potentially could be a problem. It also makes me think about people who are in relationships with people who struggle with sex addiction and and porn addiction. And I kind of want to talk a little bit more about how does this type of addiction affect relationships? Yeah, and this is something where, you know, so I'm, I'm going to speak to what I know from my experience on the one side of it. I mean, I'm not a partner trauma specialist, but I, that would be the terminology we would use, right? So when you're a partner who's been betrayed, whether or not it be a physical relationship or it's, you know, pornography, uh, a lot of the same results happen for the, for the partner. So one of the things that happens for partners typically is they will start to experience uh, very similar to PTSD or actually diagnosable PTSD symptomology. So I'll give you some examples. So one thing is what they call hypervigilance. Hypervigilance is just a fancy term for uh, detective work or kind of sort of focusing on the details or trying to find out where, where the person, catch the person in a lie almost in some ways, right? So if I, if I am betraying my partner, my partner is going to come very hyper-focused on where, what am I lying about? What am I not lying about? That's one aspect of it. Um, in some ways, the partner actually becomes almost obsessed with the behavior themselves, and they become hyper-focused on people around them as well, right? So they, they're looking for all the danger, you know, sort of people around them that can potentially, you know, their, that their partner that has just betrayed them is focusing on. So you see a lot of these type of play off, uh, it kept, they play off one another when, when in a really negative way. The examples I give, I give there two examples I think about. The first one is, you know, relationships, a fish tank. So we've got a bunch of living organisms in the fish tank. And if you put water in the fish tank, uh, that's what's going to keep everything alive. But when you introduce a betrayal, you just drop a couple drops of red food coloring in the water. The water now is red. Um, this relationship, in order for it to move forward, continue in a healthier, regardless way, if it's going to continue, you have to learn how to adapt with the red water. And so a lot of times what people have, what happens is partners will say to their, their partner who's betrayed them, hey, you go talk to Patrick and you work out your stuff. I'm not interested in doing any therapy. I'm not interested in doing anything. This isn't my problem. In some ways, they're correct about that. But in other ways, they've been affected by something that they don't. They may not even be aware of. And so one of the things for partners is that we're always very encouraging that this is something that's now relational. It's not just, you know, it's not just the person who's struggling with the addiction. This is something that is now affecting the partner most likely. And in order for the relation to move forward, they have to come together in order to work on that together. The other thing I think about, the other analogy I use for, for partner trauma is, you know, a, a person who's in P, who goes through some type of PTSD, you know, they don't know where their mind's going to take them. So I think about if you're standing on top of the Hoover Dam and the Hoover Dam bursts, you're going to go, the river's going to take you someplace you had no idea where you were going to go. And so that's what it's like kind of to some, to some degree in your mind to go down this river that you have no idea where it's going to take you. And so all you're doing is trying to grab onto something to get to some solid ground. And that's what a lot of partners are trying to do. They're trying to grab onto some level of reality because they don't really know what reality is. Because for some guys, some people, they may have been, you know, betraying them for years. It could be, you know, 5, 10, 12, 15 years that this is happening. And they're just trying to get some level of reality. So this really is something that's all encompassing in the relationship. And it's very rare that we see uh, a partner not be affected uh, in some, to some degree by some type of betrayal, um, whether or not it be through pornography or, or extramarital affair or an extra uh, affair outside the primary relationship. Right. So it sounds like what you're saying, in order for them to kind of move forward, they have to work through the addiction together. The partner who does not have the addiction, if they want to stay in a relationship, has to support the partner who's struggling with that in order for them to move forward, but also potentially recognize their PTSD or how they're suffering from this new reality of their partner having this addiction? 
Yeah. So I wouldn't, I don't know if I'd use the word support the addiction. I think so. I just, I, I know what you're saying. Right. I just think in careful yeah. terminology of that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah support the addiction that yeah. aspect. I think they have, there has to be a recognition and a, a, an acceptance that this is something that now is in our relationship. But as a partner, are you willing, are you willing, again, it's a question I ask all the time, are you, are you willing to then go and learn about you and how this has affected you? Um, it's not fair. It's not, it's not right. It's not correct. We understand that, you know, there's a lot of things there and not to minimize it, but you know, as a partner now, now I have now, what can you learn about how you're being affected by this behavior? Once that process is, uh, you know, once you're starting in that process and the, and the, and your partner is willing to do recovery or willing to do some type of work on themselves, um, there comes a point where typically what will we, and again, I don't, I'm not part of these, but I, we do hit them here at, at, the, at the practice is what they call a disclosure process. And so that's really an opportunity to, for the addict, so to speak, or the betrayer to lay all that out there. And, and, and again, it's done very therapeutically. It's done in a way that uh, is very respectful for both the partner and for the addict. And so again, that's something to help, again, build reality. What you, know, you need evidence as the person who's been lying that you are tell, now telling the truth. And so how are you going to do that? Um, and so there's a process to that in some degree. So one of the things is that, you know, we want the relationship to be healed, but the, but the relationship cannot necessarily be healed at, right after a betrayal by just going to a couple's counselor and saying, Hey, we, we got some issues. we got to work out a lot of times. Uh, and again, this is no, this is no knock on our therapist, but if you're not trained in understanding partner trauma, um, you're going to work. And I say this also work, have worked with couples. You're going to be looking for stuff that is not going to necessarily be the right tools to help. And so it's really important for both a person who's struggling with addiction and a person who's uh, betrayed to look for therapists that are going to be able to help address those specific um, behaviors because other therapists, you know, when I was a general practitioner, same kind of thing, I wouldn't have been able to um, most adequately help a person in that sense. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I've also heard about situations where people who are dating people struggling with such addictions, they end up suffering with severe self-esteem issues because the partner who has either sex or porn addiction is kind of projecting this image of imperfection with how their partner looks because they're looking at you know, images, or they're probably hooking up with people who appear to have the perfect body or have certain characteristics. And all of a sudden they're projecting that onto their actual partner and the partner in the situation starts to feel really bad about themselves and feeling really unloved and unwanted. And I think through therapy, some might discover that it's not about them. It's about the addiction. Yep. Um, and, in, and just to speak to that too, there's sometimes that, you know, again, why people are acting out, and I think a lot of times because because the way the brain changes, it's you become very self-focused. You can't see how it's affecting other people. Part of that's that denial we were talking about earlier. And so one of the things I think that comes up sometimes for folks is that the a partner or even an addict might feel like, well, the it's it's you know, I'm just a selfish person. I can't really think about other people, I can't be empathetic when when a lot of times it's about either learning some of those. We've talked about the intimacy piece. If you don't have a lot of practice with that, you're not going to know how to have that skill or, you know, the empathy is a skill. So you can learn how to, to do that, you know, as you work through therapy. But part of what I think comes up a lot of times is people feel that they're just selfish. And again, back for a partner, like, again, that you say the comparison is huge, right? So now the comparison, I'm not good enough. And, and so now you have two people who are struggling with some type of worthiness and self-esteem in the relationship. So um, it, it definitely snowballs. And it's something I think that, you know, people, I, I would say a lot of people don't really realize how much it impacts uh, both parties for sure. Is talk therapy effective when it comes to helping people get over this addiction? I think in the right context. So again, we, what we have at our, our practice, I'm part of an outpatient recovery program. So what that means is that we kind of have a three pronged approach. It's, it's based on a, a, a program developed by a man named Dr. Patrick Carnes, and he is a kind of the world renowned. He's kind of um, the original guy who did a lot of the research when it came to sex addiction. His research started in the 80s, and so he's developed a lot of programs around uh, sex addiction. <clears throat> um, so our, our program really is the, his program has three approaches to it. So you have the individual work, which is, you know, working one on one with the therapist. You have a group that's part of that, a recovery group, uh, what they call a process group. And that group is a, a little bit different than like a fellowship, like a 12 step. It's, it's therapist led and it's working through some of the material together as a group. And so you're, you're starting to build those interpersonal relationships with this group. 
And then also usually a sponsor is included in that. A sponsor is somebody who's going to kind of mentor the person one-on-one in the program. So you have kind of a therapist at the end of it, you have the group, and then you have kind of practicing the relationship aspect of it too. So there is some talk involved in that. There obviously is, you know, conversations we're having and, you know, we're trying to get to, get to a d- deeper route there. But it's not the traditional type of talk therapy from the perspective of the person comes in and we go, okay, what's our roadmap? And kind of the program is sort of our roadmap, right? So there's going to be certain tasks we're going we're to be working on. Um, Dr. Karn's program is what they call a 30 task model, meaning that for 12 step program is 12 steps. The 30 tasks is 30 tasks. It's 30 steps basically. So you have a much deeper uh, program. So it's much longer, uh, usually is, in, in, and it's going to involve much deeper work in that sense. So, um, that's kind of, you know, it, it does, it is effective, but it's effective in the right context. I think if you just go to, you know, and again, all respect to all our therapists I've worked with, our people that are out there. Um, you know, if you go to see the average therapist, general practitioner, um, they're probably not going to recommend that type of route. And they're probably just going to kind of work on, uh, the typical type talk, talk therapy type thing. So you're, you might not be able to have the same amount of effect as you would be if you're working with a specialist. That makes a lot of sense. I, I spoke with uh, another therapist out of New Zealand, Dr. Luke Snooski, and we briefly touched on it. He's a somatic therapist and he actually works with a lot of men who struggle with porn addiction as well. And he his approach is more on the somatic side of therapy, which is body-based therapy, yep. if I'm describing that correctly. Um, so that's part of the reason I asked. And I also you know, wanted to know, do you consider this type of addiction a disease? Because I hear people talk in general. I've heard the term that, or I've heard the saying that addiction is a disease. Once an addict, always an addict. I find I struggle with that because I think that kind of labels someone and doesn't give people much hope. But I just wanted to hear from your perspective. Do you think this type of addiction is a disease? I also struggle with that same idea that, you know, once you're an act, you're always an act. I will say it like this is that um, diseases, when we have a physical disease in our body, some diseases alter what our, our body um, genetically is part of, right? So we there's a change in that. And so I can't think of a great one on top of my head, but if let's say if I, a cold changed me for the rest of my life, meaning that my genetics changed for having a cold, would I truly be a per, would I always have a cold for the rest of my life? Probably not, right? I wouldn't have the symptomology for it. It's similar in the same idea when we're talking about how the brain is altered. And so there's a lot of different things out there. The way I use my, my analogy, I think about is that, you know, we have the way the brain communicates with itself and the way it interacts with the you know, different things in the world is like, we have a bunch of little freeways in our, in our brain. So we have a bunch of like, you know, you go from point A to point B, you think about Google maps, you know, if you look up, you want to go traveling across the country, you know, you go from New York to LA, you're going to have three different routes. Typically that's going to take you, you know, it's going to be a fastest route, you know, maybe a scenic route and then a route that um, is going to be, you know, somewhere in the middle, you know, kind of idea. If we think about the brain, the same context is that the things we do over and over again, our brain loves to streamline. So what ends up happening is there's things that are habits that everybody has that feel very organic and feel very like I'm flipping the switch on. I just get to go and do them and I don't have to think a lot about it. Right. Those are the probably the pathways in our life that are very much entrenched. Those are the eight lane freeways where there's a lot of traffic. It's very easy for us to go down there. Um, it doesn't take a lot of effort, right? We just automatically kind of go down that place. Pornography and other types of addictive behavior. I would I would tend to lean more toward the what they call the process addiction, so more so the food addictions and the and the sex side of it, rather than the substances, because the substances I can remove, and then you know again I, I probably can I, I hit the reset and I kind of reheal from that, and that's about trying to stay away from that that substance. Because food and sex are both part of who we are as people. Uh, those pathways, particularly that are in our brain, um, they're and just like anything that was in our brain, those, those pathways remain there. They remain, they're always going to be in our brain. Now, when we choose to do a different behavior, our brain actually has to build a new freeway. Now, in order for it to do that, it has to start out as a walking path, then it becomes a bike path, then it becomes a two lane road, then a four lane road, et cetera. So eventually that becomes the way we're eventually going to, our intention turns that, turns that into a new pathway. But the old freeways always remain. Those don't go away. They become dormant 
or they become kind of unused. You know, I live in Michigan, so a lot of the freeways around here have giant holes and cracks in them and everything else. They're really unmaintained. So that's kind of like what happens when we don't use those other pathways. But it doesn't take much for us to go back to the old pathway. And when we do that, it smooths out really quickly because the brain the brain's very efficient, it likes to get rid of stuff that holds it up from that kind of efficiency. So there's a video out there of a guy, uh, they made this backwards bike. Um, so basically when you turn left, the, the bike goes right and vice versa. And it took him eight months to learn how to ride the backwards bike. But it took him 20 minutes to learn how to ride the, the bike the right, the, 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 the normal way, correct way. And that's just an illustration of how quickly it takes for us to jump back on that old pathway and how our brain can remember that very quickly. So what I always say when you're talking about overcoming consistent compulsive behavior is what are your intention? Because intentionality takes a lot of practice and it also takes a lot of hard work to do where the things that feel organic or natural are really usually kind of flip the switch and it's automatic. So when I want to change certain behaviors, I want to, you know, again, back to kind of the question about is this a disease? I think if we're talking about it being, has it altered my brain to the point that that's something I'm always going to have to be aware of? Then yes, it's a disease. If I feel like, is it always going to be, the symptomology is always going to be there? Does that make it a disease? I'd say that there's hope that that there's hope in recovery and in the process of change that would say that it's not a disease. So it depends on how you define disease. Do you find disease as long-term, this is how my brain's been affected for the rest of my life? Then yes, then, it, then I could see where you would say it is a disease. If you're saying it's symptomology, then I would say, no, it's not a disease because um, the symptomologies can change. And the symptomologies of people are very, we've discovered over you know, the last probably 30 years or so that the brain is very malleable. It's very plastic. It has a ability to be, there's really nothing hardwired in our brain other than our genetics. And so our brain really has the ability to be able to be flexible and malleable. So if that's the case, then really we can work on changing anything we want about ourselves, personal and our personality, but it will take a period of time and it will take intentional work to do that. I'm curious to know, do you know much about neuro-linguistic programming? I think that's maybe the first time I've ever heard of it. <laughs> really? Okay. So I'll let that go because I actually spoke with um, a woman who actually works with men to overcome porn addiction. She was a sex addict herself and kind of healed through that. And now she, you know, is certified in a few different areas. But one of the areas that she's certified in is this concept of neuro-linguistic programming. And part of the reason I asked that as well is because I was thinking about um, rational recovery. I don't know if you've ever heard of that book. I think it's for alcoholics, people who struggle with alcohol addiction. And I also read this book called Brain Over Binge. And essentially, and which was related to food, right? So to to your point about there are different types of addictions, some are substance-based, and then there are other ones like food. We can't get away from food. We need food to survive. And, And sex is part of that relational aspect of what it means to be a human being. But, you know, in Brain Over Binge, which was focused on food, she picked up some insights from Rational Recovery, which talked about the fact that a lot of addictions and when it comes to talk therapy, she found herself going in circles because they were telling her that her addiction was because of how she felt about herself on the inside. While that might have triggered a lot of why she did what she did, the author of the book basically said that she was able to recover from her eating order after having it for about six to seven years when she realized that she did not have to relate with her thoughts because triggers are always going to be a part of life. There's always going to be something that will trigger a response. She talked about she ate when she was happy. She ate when she was sad. She ate when she was anxious. So if she's eating for everything, then the issue is not necessarily the emotions because those are there. It's about how her brain is wired, like what you were talking about, because the more you do something, the more your brain, we're kind of like machines. We kind of go into autopilot. So that's why I asked that. And I just kind of wonder in, in your approach, do you center a lot of the recovery based on the person's emotions and what they're going through in life? Or do you kind of talk about why their brain is responding to external stuff 
rather than their emotions. I don't know if that's making sense yeah, really, yeah. with so, what I'm trying to say. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think you bring up a really good point. So there, there's an aspect of this behavior and across the board. And I think what you made, the point you made about the idea that, right, like what's our relationship with our emotions? Uh, I think about emotions, you know, on a railroad track that's simultaneous with our thoughts. A lot of people will be very uncomfortable if those don't align because sometimes they'll just, you know, go way off track and then this will keep going straight and it doesn't make sense. So there is a little bit absolutely about the relationship that we have with our thoughts and with our emotions and do those correlate. There's a lot of times they don't, but are we willing to sort of investigate that? A little more to what you're saying, to your point, I think that, you know, it depends if you're if you're someone who has experienced a lot of trauma, then you can go more along. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't have a huge trauma background, so I can't really speak too much to this. But I know from my experience with working with addiction is that there are periods of, there are some people who have a lot of, have had a lot of trauma in their life. And so what ends up happening is that there, you, that's where you can really work more with the body. Uh, there's a book out there by a guy named Bessel van der Kook. It's called The Body Keeps the Score. It's a relatively new book, and it, they really have a whole new look on trauma. And really, that's more where you can look at kind of the body physically reacting to certain things. And so that was much more – there's a different There's a different perspective you have to have with that than if you have with someone who may have not has much trauma, but certainly has, so like you said, more of the background of the worthiness and kind of those internalized dialogue with themselves. And that also kind of brings us back to some shame pieces because how we respond to shame is a big part of what, how you know people will react to different things, uh, whether it be food, you know, sex, whatever it might be that people are, you know, there's a lot of shame people experience. And so, you know, again, that's some of that internalized dialogue, but there can be shame that's associated with trauma. And so the, the trauma perspective is a little bit different than maybe somebody who might be looking at it from a, like, you know, more of an internalized perspective. And that's, that's a little more of my background as far as kind of just in my, just my own worldview of that. It's, of like helping people kind of understand their own, their own internalized dialogue and their own emotions and those kind of things. But I think you bring up a great point is that, you know, there's, there, there's probably as we move forward, as we continue to learn more about the body, the brain, um, there's so many different ways people are going to be approaching uh, this behavior and, and how to help people with the, with this particular concern. Yes, I, I agree with that. And if you are working with shit, they're doing well, but then they leave your office and see a billboard with someone in a bathing suit, right? What are some techniques that you offer to people struggling with this addiction on how to manage all these different sexual images? I know some people, they are no longer on social media, for example, because they're constantly seeing that. So is the suggestion that they completely get rid of their social media or, you know, how can they manage their reactions to living in such a hyper sexual society? Great question. Uh, so yeah, so some, some people uh, probably should seriously consider going on well, maybe a, a social media hiatus for a while, right? At least to give yourself a chance to kind of reset from it for yourself personally. A couple of things that I, I talk about as far as helping people break thought, right? Go back to thought life. My thought life is really going to be, you know, again, depending on where, where, what I'm what I'm thinking about, what I'm processing. We're all going to have. There's definitely going to have trigger triggers, or you know, I use like to use the word stimuli because there's a lot. You know, triggers is an overused word, but basically, uh, stimuli that we're going to have out in the world, whether it be social media or in public or whatever. One thing you can use uh, that, that people tend to find some success with is this idea of what they call ABC: awareness, break, compassion. So basically, the idea is I made awareness of the person or the or the image that's that's uh, concerned for me. I'm breaking from it. I'm redirecting my mind to something else that I, that, you know, again, keep, brings peace, brings calm. I can think about, and then I have compassion toward myself or toward the other person. Sometimes that looks like self-talk. You know, I'm not this type of man anymore. I'm not this type of woman anymore. I'm going to be somebody who's dedicated to, to living in a healthy sexual way. So that'd be kind of an example of, of compassion. One that sometimes people have success with is what they call fantasy contamination. And this is kind of similar to uh, the drug. I don't know the drug specifically, but if you drink alcohol, you'll get sick and vomit. So eventually there's association with that. Fantasy contamination is very similar. Bringing something that you find that's gross, that's abnormal, that doesn't make a lot of sense for that particular image. I always think of something goofy like, uh, you know, there's a giant Twinkie or something in the, you know, holding hands with the jogger or whatever, you know, something that just throws it off so that I don't have to, to keep associating down that fantasy. Because the more I fantasize about that, the more likely that I'm going to be drawn to going to act out somewhere or continuing to fantasize. The one I've also found to be kind of, uh, that I personally have found to be successful, at least some of the time for folks, is to create lists 
of things that they know a lot about because as the as you make lists, you're breaking that loop. And and it seems like fantasy kind of loops very similar to anxiety does. And so it's a similar kind of way that you break that. You kind of put a bend in the track a little bit so that it doesn't keep going. I was like using NFL teams because they're really easy to remember in divisions. They're all in four four groupings. So like I'm in Detroit. So it's Detroit, uh, Chicago, Minnesota, and Green Bay. Those are our four teams in the north. So and then you can keep going through that. Now that's just the one for guys. Sometimes that can be an easy one, but you could use use the stuff that you know because you can remember it easier and you can kind of pull it up. So um, I've you know used sports teams. Uh, you know, it could be baseball, it could be soccer, it could be uh, basketball, anything like that. You know, music, um, you know, cars, stuff that you know helps you to have that list that that can kind of help break some of those thoughts so you're not focusing on um, what the stimuli might be. I appreciate that a lot of people who struggle with these thoughts these hypersexual thoughts could also potentially have mental issues related to ocd i don't see much of a, of a i don't see in my personal experience i don't see a lot of correlation with ocd um okay. most of the time the correlation we see the biggest one is adhd or add some type of, of an attention because the number one thing that drowns out a lot of those kind of uh, difficult you know the the constant flow of those thoughts is pornography. When we, when we focus on pornography or something sexual, our brain kind of just zooms right there. And because it holds that much attention, it tends to sort of drown out a lot of other stuff. So people with ADHD or ADD tend to sort of find that a very soothing way to kind of approach that. And so you can feel less numb, less, less of the, of, of the thoughts in your head in that way. So ADHD and ADD are usually common ones. Uh, sometimes ASD is one of them. So autism spectrum is one that we see a little bit occasionally. I haven't seen as much with OCD though. Mostly, mostly those are there too, ASD and uh, ADHD, ADD. Okay. So is there hope for full recovery? Have you worked with patients who have fully recovered and they're, they're doing well? I mean, triggers are side, but they're not acting on triggers. Do you, do you, have you worked with patients who've been able to fully recover? So I'm in a process because of, because of when I started, um, our program is anywhere between three to the current program is anywhere between three to five years long. So I'm in year four. So I haven't seen an, anybody from start to finish go all the way through, but I am working with people at different stages in the process. And so there are people who definitely at the end of this process are able to heal from that. But I think we really need to look at what does it mean to be healed from this? Uh, a lot of times people will report to me very early in the process and they'll say, you know, I want to be totally free from this. I never want to have another thought about this. I don't want this to come up for me and those, those kind of things. And so they're a little bit unrealistic in that. Is it going to be something that's going to control your life? You can recover from that. Absolutely. hundred percent. Is it going to be something that you're going to not be able to be aware of for the rest of your life? A hundred percent inaccurate. You have to always be aware of it because it's something that you're going to always have to be aware of these things that come around. So like, I'll just give you an example. Um, one of the things that happens with people with, with the phone, a lot of times that people take the phone in the bedroom and the bathroom, those are two of the places where people most commonly act out, at least in my experience. So even just creating those boundaries around the phone in the, in the, in the bedroom and the bathroom, if I don't take my phone in those things, at least I'm eliminating opportunity to act out. So one of the things that down the road, does that mean that, okay, when I fully recover, I can start taking my phone in the bathroom or the bedroom again? No, because I'm still setting myself up for the possibility of it happening, even if I think I have the strength of it. One of the things about denial is denial is always about minimiz well, like one of the biggest denials I see all the time is minimization. It, it wants us to believe that we're stronger than we, uh, than we actually are. And it does that, you know, our own mind tells us that, hey, we can overcome this. Now, I'm not saying that people can't be confident in their recovery. They 100% can be. But if they're confident in their recovery, they also know how to respect what their, their addict or their addiction has been. And so you can't lose that sight of that respect because if you do, it's going to dra- it's going to pull you in the position where you're going to be weak and you're going to just like a city with a wall around it. You're going to there's some part of your wall that's going to have a hole in it if you're not uh, aware of that. So, can you recover from the perspective of it never being a problem for you again? I think that's unrealistic. But can you get to a point where the behavior is not what you compulsively do? I I think that's 100% realistic. I have to ask just because of your work in, in your style of work specifically in your training how for for patients who are open to the theology side how does faith play a role in helping people move through shame and work towards recovery for those who are interested in yeah, including that mm-hmm. into yeah. their recovery yeah and i think 
So a lot of times we use the verbiage, the addict, I would replace that with the sin nature. If you're talking about theology, our sin nature is always at every given moment of our life, waging war against us. And it wants to, it wants us to just be destroyed. It's not going to look, it's not going to want us to be successful in any way. Part of shame is one of the, one of the biggest lies that I think we believe um, we take on those lies. And again, if you're, if you are, Describing to being a Christian, you, you're going to, that's the perspective I'm coming from. And that's been, we're going to believe those lies and those lies are going to define who we are. And so one of the things biblically that we see over and over again throughout the Bible is that the reason that one of the reasons that God came to save us and, and to die on the cross for our sins was to us to give a new identity and to have a new heart. And so shame is a continuous lie of the enemy. So are we willing to allow that the lie to continue in our lives? And if we don't, why, why are we believing that if we are allowing that, that lie to continue, why are we believing it? Uh, because we have a freedom in, in, in Christ to be able to live out, um, to live out the, the way he's to you know, the way he wants us to live and then basically live in the freedom of how he's, you know, his image. So I think a lot of times when you're talking about shame, believing that lie, and then consistently going back to that type of behavior, it doesn't mean that you yourself there's something wrong, but it means that are you where are you still working on understanding and, and believing and, and holding to the truth that you are you know subscribing to in your faith? Uh, a lot of times, you know, I think that you know there is the science part of it, which we talked a lot about today, but the other side of it from the theological perspective is, do I really believe that that's the person that I am, or do I believe that I'm the person that God says I am? And so if I hold to that truth, those are the truths I have to hold to as far as, you know, moving forward and allowing that, that other part of who I am to um, to, to die, because that's that's what it has to do. And so uh, there's a part uh, Paul talks about the idea that we have to work out our salvation in faith and trembling. And so that means that's a process. And so sanctification, which is the process of becoming more like Christ, is a process of every single day working toward just like the process of walking away from something that's an addiction. And so these things we talked about earlier, I mentioned the idea that we want these things to be organic in our lives, but they are not organic. They have to be intentional. My relationship with my faith or my relationship with Christ is all intention, as much as the same as intention to be away from, from pornography. So how intentional am I willing to be in my life or my, do I want the organic? Do I want the, do I want to flip the switch and just go, you know, go along the easy route? Um, nothing that's uh, easy ever ends up being rewarding. So the, the, the direction we want to go is about how intentional are we going to be in working toward becoming the people we want or the people that God wants us to be. So there is that aspect of that, you know, when you talk about faith, um, you know, there's the intention still goes the same, you know, in that direction. We're, that's a process. Thank you for sharing that. I love the line that you said, and I hope I don't butcher it. Do we want to believe what, the enemy is telling us about ourselves, or do we want to believe what God tells us about ourselves? I think that's what you said. I love that yeah. line. Well, because it's a choice, right? We Every day we have a choice to decide, okay, today I woke up, am I going to believe what I believe my faith is, which again, takes faith. It's not going to be yeah. something that's going to be, you know, just like that. But if I, but it also takes the same, you know, in some ways also the same amount of faith to believe that I'm, that I'm what the devil tells me I am too, right? So I have to be intentional in what I'm going to choose to believe. And I can, and, and if I continue to allow the, the lie to be my, my truth, um, even when it's not, um, I'm not going to probably see a lot of changes there. I'm probably going to continue the same path. Yes, exactly. And I could even, even using uh, different languaging for people who might not even be Christian is just the idea is, am I going to feed into these negative thoughts that I'm having and give my power to those negative thoughts? Or am I going to connect with the true essence of who I am as a person. So yeah. I'm going to believe who I am as create, created to be, or am I going to believe that I'm this, you know, the person that doesn't believe the lie that the, that the addiction tells me that I am. Right. Exactly. Patrick, this has been a great conversation and I usually like to end out each episode with asking every guest for final words of wisdom. You've shared so many insights but any words of wisdom, it could be related to what we've been talking about or something completely random that you kind of keep in your back pocket as you go through life. Yeah, it's hard to always pick just one thing that, you, you know, we could we could we could specifically focus on. But um, I've just had a real heart. I've had a real feel like a real revelation in my own life in the last few few months about the idea that my my intention is what I need to, that's my, my intention is what is going to get me toward the direction I want to go. And there's nothing that's difficult. There's nothing easy about intention. 
And so there's a part of me in my life and my personal story that I feel like I've, I've always wanted to get to that organic that I was talking about earlier. I want it to be flip the switch. I want it to be easy. I think everybody as a human being does to some degree, but um, just like a, when you're, per, if you're, if you're had a personal trainer, they're going to make you do two things. They're going to make you change what you're eating if you don't eat right. And they're going to make you work out. Both of those things are really hard, but you'll get the results that you want to have. And that's the same way with mental health. I mean, if you, you, there's, there's a, there may not be a whole bunch of stuff you have to do, but there has to be some kind of change. Um, one of the things that my, uh, my boss likes to talk about as far as the program goes is that nothing changes if nothing changes. And that is very true. Um, but I think it, it, nothing changes if intention is not there um, because I can't just, you know, in my mind, fantasize again, like we talked about earlier, fantasize about change. A lot of people, I think, think that the change that they see is the change they see here. They don't see the change out here. And that's because they're not willing to make it from this part to out here, which is the hard part. So I think a big part of that is, you know, continuing to make your intentions be what you, not only what you say you want, you want, but also be what you're doing. And that goes in, in line with your faith or recovering from something or changing any type of behavior you want. You have to, you have to see the execution of it um, be played out. It can't just be in your head. I love that. I love that. It kind of reminds me of something I heard earlier today, which said that in order for you to create a new reality or to achieve something, you have to become the person that has that thing or is living in this new said reality or life or vision that you have for yourself. So I appreciate you for sharing that. Where can people find you if they want to connect with you or learn more about your work? Absolutely. So uh, our, our practice website is northpoint-counseling.com. Um, we are located in Novi, Michigan. We are one of Michigan's largest uh, resources for sexual addiction and partner betrayal trauma. So if you're interested in working with any of us or, um, you know, again, on the partner trauma piece as well, learning more about that, um, definitely check us out on the website. We are actually starting our own podcast here. Uh, it just got launched, I think, earlier this month, but we're going to start trying to do a weekly podcast. Um, I'm going to be included in that. My boss is going to be included in that. Um, multiple part of my, um, many of my colleagues are a part of that. So we're going to hopefully have some guests as well, but we're hoping to have that be success as well and being a resource for folks. Um, another thing to look into is our, my boss wrote a book uh, a couple of years ago. It's called the partner's guide to truth and healing. Um, that is a great resource for folks who are looking for, um, any type of partner trauma type of understanding, kind of what that process looks like. We were kind of talking about earlier. You can reach me at my personal Instagram. It's rated underscore PGE. I also have a threads account attached to that as well. Um, I also have a LinkedIn. It's Patrick Eilers, and you saw my kind of credentials right there. That's that's my LinkedIn account. So um, there are a couple of our Patrick Eilers out there, but I don't know if they if they're therapists or not. But uh, so uh, those are some things you can look for for me there, and um, and uh, I can I can give those to you if you'd like uh, in the, in uh, an email or anything. Yes, that'd be great. So I can link it in the show notes. Thank you so much, Patrick, for stopping by. A word to the wise. Thank you so much for having me, Jimmy. I really appreciate it. A big shout out to Patrick Eilers for stopping by the show. If you are interested in learning more about Patrick, please check out the show notes for a link to his social media, podcast, and website. And please make sure that you tune back in for part two of the series, which is focused on porn and sex addiction, where I speak with a woman who struggled with sex addiction and dated a man who struggled with porn addiction. And we discuss how she was able to recover from sex addiction and what it was like dating someone with porn addiction and how that affected her and so much more. It was a very good episode as well. So please make sure you tune into part two of this short series. Again, thank you so much for tuning in. You can follow Over to the Wise on Instagram and TikTok at Over to the Wise Pod. We're also on YouTube at Over to the Wise Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe. If you are enjoying the show, please rate, leave a review, share, and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Till next time, peace and love. Always, always, always.